Thank you. The next item of business is members' business debate on motion 12167 in the name of Richard Lockhead on ensuring appropriate community benefit from offshore, sorry, onshore wind farm developments. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Richard Lockhead to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Can I begin by thanking colleagues for signing the motion and for staying behind for this debate. Deputy Presiding Officer, Scotland's transformation into renewables per house has been one of this government and this parliament's biggest success stories. It was tremendous news when ministers announced recently that for 2017 it was a record year for renewable electricity and that 68.1% of gross electricity consumption was met by renewables. As the most commercially viable technology, onshore wind has led the way and now employs 8,000 people across Scotland. As a result, many communities have found themselves as neighbours to wind farms. Sometimes they're controversial, often they're widely supported. And we've seen community benefit funds set up that provide community buy-in and a share of the benefits from such developments. Our natural resources belong to us all, and when they're exploited, we should all benefit, particularly communities adjacent to the developments. We'll all be familiar with groups that have benefited from grants over the years that make a difference by supporting rural development and good causes. And of course, such funds have allowed communities to invest in local projects that benefit everyone. And that's why uh, I was pleased to hear from Keith and Dufton Railway Association, my own constituency, just last week, that they have benefited from local wind farm funds uh, as well. Now, following the industry's own protocols, the Scottish Government published good practice principles for community benefits from onshore renewable energy developments in 2014, a policy that, th that is now being reviewed. Ministers were quite right to state that no one, fits, no one size fits all when it comes to community benefits. And then, of course, they were right to promote a national rate for onshore renewables in terms of benefits. This was needed because the success of communities negotiating community benefits was variable across the country, to say the least. Some communities negotiated significant amounts and others didn't. And it often depends on our local community's capacity or the presence of strong personalities and community leaders as to whether a decent level of benefit is secured. That's why a national standard was established, along with a voluntary register, managed by Local Energy Scotland to help equip communities with the appropriate knowledge to strengthen their arms in negotiations. Many developers, of course, take their obligations to the communities very, very seriously, but communities do always need to drive a hard bargain. And some developers have managed to get off scot-free or to avoid paying the recommended level of 5,000 pounds, or at least 5,000 pounds per megawatt. The landowner strikes gold, the operator generates significant profits, profits as well, but the local community can be left with the crumbs off the table or with nothing at all. Now, energy is a multi-billion pound business and all our communities are asking for is their fair share. That's why it's a great shame that uh, a massive French company, EDF, have found themselves in dispute with representative communities in my constituency affected by the Dornell Wind Farm, uh, to give just one example. The community associations in Murray covering Dufton and Glenlivet and Inveran and Glenrinnes and the Cabrach have come together as the united communities impacted by the Dornell Wind Farm Limited to seek the recommended £5,000 per megawatt. EDF have told me they don't believe they have to deliver the national standard as the previous owner of the development agreed a lesser amount that they claim the community at that point in time accepted. The local communities, however, dispute that and there is no written agreement in place that anyone can find. EDF are paying £2,000 per megawatt to a fund and argue that once non-monetary benefits are added to that, it rises to £4,000 per megawatt. Although they originally claimed an email to me in December that the benefits amounted to nearly £5,000, but they're now saying £4,000. However, the community argue that some of the non-monetary benefits that are part of that calculation were linked to planning conditions. And it's worth noting uh, they also include the refurbishment of properties owned by the landowner, London-based Christopher Moran, who I might add has often been criticised for not investing in these properties at his own expense to help attract people to live and work in the Cabrach. So it's a win-win for the landowner. He gets rent from EDF for the land that he's told happens to be in a windy area, and according to SPICE, the Parliament's Information Centre, the annual accounts for Glenfiddich Wind Limited showed annual profits amounting to nearly £43 million between 2015 and 2017 alone. 
And Christopher Moran Energy Limited, I think that's a subsidiary of them, shows a handsome prof profit too. And he probably can't believe his luck that he gets his properties refurbished at someone else's expense, which is then classed as a community benefit. It has to be said, that onshore energy is a license to print money for many landowners in Scotland. And in today's world, money makes money, but local communities deserve to have their share guaranteed as well. And in estimating EDF's income from Dornell over the next 25 years, there are clearly many variables at play over such a long time frame. But I have seen estimates of anywhere between one and one and a half billion pounds. Whatever the figure, and we don't know what the figure will be, it's safe to say that EDF and the landowner will make significant profits. So can anyone wonder why the local community feel they're getting a poor deal? Can anyone wonder why in some parts of Scotland, the creation and strengthening of mutual trust and relationships that should be regarded as integral to the overall process, to quote the Minister's aspirations, is severely lacking. Now, I'm not saying that private companies that carry the risk, invest millions and make projects happen, should not make a good profit. And I'm not saying that all benefits need to be monetary. And I'm not saying the wider benefits for the Scottish supply chain are not very, very important. EDF tell me they've spent £40 million in the Scottish supply chain. And of course, that is extremely welcome for the Scottish economy. I am saying we need more consistency across Scotland in terms of community benefits, that it should be in a statutory footing and transparent and retrospective for projects that receive government subsidies and that communities deserve a greater share of the benefits. My key ask is that ministers work with the sector to ensure all developers deliver the national recommended standard. The Scottish Government has made great progress in promoting community benefit. Local Energy Scotland's website says that communities have benefited from nearly £15 million in the past year. But there is still some way to go because the same website says the average payment is £3,454, excluding community projects. And I understand that 50 projects, that's about 26%, are either not paying any community benefit or the available data is incomplete. It's a better story for community-owned projects and I'm delighted there are now 40 such projects in Scotland. I've long supported also a nationally owned energy company to have joint ventures with private uh, companies and also to work with communities as well. But in closing, can I say that until we sort this out, until we have the national standard adhered to and full transparency, Scotland's communities will continue to lose out on millions of pounds a year that could be put to good use in these very difficult times especially rural communities that ironically pay more for their electricity and suffer higher rates of fuel poverty. So I urge the Minister in closing to intervene to deliver the national standards and to seek the necessary powers from the UK government and UK ministers to regulate community benefit and ensure that transparency that's required. And finally, to ensure that our communities enjoy a fair share of revenues from the renewables revolution. Thank you, Mr Lockhead. We now move to the open debate and speeches of up to four minutes, please. And I call Alexander Burnett to be followed by Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Richard Lockhead for bringing this topic to a members' debate and just note my register of interest around the renewable energy sector. Now, as the motion notes, it's great to see that renewable energy production is up and that communities across Scotland are benefiting from it. Because as the Chamber will know, the Scottish Conservatives support onshore wind where appropriate, and when local communities support and want it. We therefore believe it is correct that the onshore wind subsidy existed to kick-start projects across Scotland, but also feel that it is appropriate to remove that subsidy now that projects can be funded on their own. Because onshore wind farm income can bring real opportunities for local communities, with new playing fields, village halls and more. And these communities that benefit exist in all of our constituencies, including my own. Now, I'm not sure if this counts as a registered interest, but it should certainly count as a plug for their application. Uh, for my wife sits on our local primary school's PTA board, and they're currently submitting an application to get funding for a trim trail. Um, Mill H Mid Hill Wind Farm Limited, based in Fetteressa Forest, set up a community benefit fund as part of their ongoing commitments to communities in the vicinity of their wind farm. The purpose of a fund is to enable communities to carry out improvements to their local area in any sphere, including the environment, local amenity or tourism. And each year they give approximately 5,500 to the Crathis, Dromoke and Durris Community Association, who in turn administer its disbursements to the community. Now another example in the constituency of a wind farm successfully supporting the community is the Huntley District Development Trust. 
Set up in 2009, it is a community-owned company which can make 65,000 a year from their wind turbines with the income going towards social projects. And these social projects vary from car clubs to tackling mental health issues and building new footpaths. Now, whilst I recognise that these are not large companies, I feel that lessons can be learned from a trust such as Huntley District. Because it is important that if a community chooses to, they can share in the benefits of the onshore wind industry and be empowered by having the choice of investing in what matters most to them, whether that be a new sports field, community hall or trim trail. Yeah. Neil Finlay. Some crumbs from the table. It would be better if communities had actual stake in the ownership of these projects so that rather than get crumbs, they get a bigger bit of the cake. Alexander Burnett. That was a point I just made of, of the uh, Huntley District uh, Trust, which does have a, a considerably larger stake in its project uh, and uh, is making 65,000 a year. So you know, that kind of model is, is, is certainly possible and I'm sure desirable for many communities. Uh, so we continue to believe that decisions of wind farms should not be overturned by the Scottish Government, especially if communities are against a development being in their area. But what we would encourage the Scottish Government to do would be to ensure that there are consistent levels of community benefit paid out across Scotland. Now, as Richard Lockett notes in his motion, some companies are delivering £5,000 per megawatt to the local area, but it is a very inconsistent picture, with some delivering well above or well below this average. We therefore believe that the Scottish Government should carry out a study with a view to introducing uh, minimum funding per megawatt for community benefit to create some more consistency into this framework although this, of course, should be caveated with a consideration of local community impact. A low-carbon future is important to all of us, but we must ensure that communities benefit fairly too. Thank you. I call Graham Day to be followed by Neil Finlay. Uh, President Officer, thank, uh, thank you. Let me begin by congratulating Richard Locke here on securing a debate on a topic which impacts a sizable number of communities across Scotland. As the motion rightly highlights in terms of our energy needs and owing to climate change, we need to embrace renewables in Scotland, as we've heard, has a good track record in this regard. Developments must, of course, be in the right place, and local communities in turn should benefit financially from these. So I note with concern the situation highlighted by Richard Lockhead at Dunnell and suggestions I understand that community benefit over the 25-year lifespan of the project could amount to £11 million rather than £27.5 million. It may perhaps surprise members to learn that there's only one wind farm in my constituency. That's at Ark Hill and is operated by Green Cat Renewables. The Glamson Area Community Trust exists to distribute the funds from the Ark Hill Wind Farm at Windfall Revenue Scheme, which was set up on a voluntary basis by Green Cat as the Ark Hill site was granted planning consent before the time when it became the norm for such benefit to be derived locally. Applications are invited from within the, from within the boundaries of the Glams Community Council area and the Trust seeks to support projects that promote citizenship and community benefit, the arts, culture, heritage or science, the provision of recreational facilities uh, and environmental protection or improvement projects. Uh, an annual contribution is made to the Trust and a number of projects within the local area have been supported by this funding. They've included a, a grant to Glen Ogilvy Residents Association for two defibrillators and to Charleston Village Hall uh, for a, an access ramp for wheelchair uh, access. Uh, the Trust also granted the Saddle Up Ranch, which is a project to improve horse riding facilities at Glams for the disabled and recovering persons. Worthy projects worthy of support. We do need to be mindful, however, that companies should not be too restrictive when drawing up the terms of their community benefit schemes. And I do not say that in relation to Ark Hill. Rather, the western part of my constituency runs along the border between Angus and Perth and Ross councils. As I said, there's one wind farm in my constituency. However, from Derg Wind Farm is only a couple of kilometres from the Angus boundary and is both seen and heard by properties in Gonaiwa and Kilray. Despite being so close, no community benefit is provided to my constituents there. I'm told that Aylith in Perth and Kinross has had significant benefits from Drum Derg, but people living there cannot see nor hear it. This has, of course, rightly caused some consternation amongst my constituents in this locality and is a matter which does, I would contend, require attention. With offshore wind farms largely located in rural areas, this potential funding for local projects uh, will become even more vital because of the uncertainty surrounding the future of the leader scheme after Brexit. As I highlighted in a member's debate a few months ago, President Officer, leader has been a lifeline for many projects in Angus South. 
But setting aside the concerns over what Brexit will mean, leader funding available in Angus is fast running out, partly and wrongly in my view, through Angus Council and its leisure and culture arms length organisation, Angus Alive, having been awarded funding. I accept that the rules allow for this and the provision of mobile library services, for example, to those in rural areas is an important one. But should public bodies really be able to access this funding to the detriment of community groups and small local businesses? Community groups and small businesses seeking to develop and help their local areas, I believe, should be at the front of any funding queue. So as leader cash runs out and with no certainty over future replacements, monies derived from wind farms in the form of community benefit becomes all the more critical. So once again, I thank Richard Lockhead for bringing this topic to the Chamber and for, highlight, and for highlighting, and I endorse the text of the motion and support his call for having the national standard of community benefit placed on a statutory footing. Presiding officer. Call Neil Finlay to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Um, again, I would thank Richard Leonard, uh, Richard, Leonard Richard Lockhead, uh, for his uh, 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 bringing this to the chamber and, and for what I think was an excellent speech summarising exactly the issues that are at stake here. I have to also apologise to the presiding officer for having to leave for the policing statement after uh, my speech. Um, I, I raised this issue in uh, one of my first uh, members' debates when I came to this parliament, so I'm delighted that. Uh, Seven years later, uh, other people are catching up, but I say that with tongue-in-cheek, of course. Um, I was interested in Graham Day saying that he has one uh, wind farm in his constituency. I have um, uh, around seven or eight within three miles or four miles of my house, over a hundred, uh, well over a hundred turbines. Um, and I think wind energy in the, the onshore sector is one of the biggest missed opportunities we have overseen for decades, because that natural resource that should be providing years of clean energy and finance for communities, uh, for a whole host of communities, has instead become a Klondike for speculators. These organisations submit planning applications and take their chance, often in the hope uh, that uh, the government uh, will call them in if they're rejected by local authorities. And their interests of, the interests of many of these people are not driven by environmental concerns or, or, or anything else. They're driven by hard cash. They would just as readily invest in coffee beans or widgets or whatever it was if it was providing the same returns. Now, that's, I, I don't generalise about all of them, but that is what happens with a number. In my area um, uh, and across many parts of Scotland, the development of wind farms is dominated by multinational uh, companies and venture capital firms that see Scotland's wind just as the latest commodity and they'll do whatever it takes, uh, including trampling over the concerns of local com communities to take advantage of the significant profits that are open to them. These companies often set up local front companies uh, as, a, as a front for the project. They'll call it, you know, fluffy animals, um, renewables or nice green forest renewables. They get their planning application and then suddenly the mask is whipped away and we see who's really behind these uh, uh, projects. Uh, for miles all around my home, I see turbines turning. And every time it turns, I see another bunch of £10 notes fluttering off to the bank accounts of Danish and Dutch and Austrian and French and Spanish boardrooms. And yes, community benefit schemes exist, but the sums involved are a drop in the ocean compared to the cash that's been generated by the big companies that dominate the, scenes, the scene. A robust community benefit strategy could result in significant cash as well as energy being generated for communities uh, and local services. We should have public bodies owning and developing wind, uh, onshore wind. We could have local authorities doing it, the Forestry Commission doing it. We could have Scottish Water and others doing it and generating money to go back into servi services, but it isn't. We are seeing a few crumbs from the table going into communities in an attempt to buy them off. Um, I know because before coming into this parliament, I led a group of negotiators from West Lothian Council negotiating a community development, uh, a deal on behalf of a community development trust in my then council ward, and that was with Scottish Power, now Iberdola. We struck a decent deal, a six-figure deal at that time, uh, and... The circumstances were that we had very little guidance or information to draw on, as this was in the very early days of community benefit. 
And one of the issues then was that in the very final round of negotiations, having taken that through about six stages, the owners withdrew the, the, the ownership option that we wanted. We wanted ownership. We didn't want crumbs from the table, and that was withdrawn at the last minute. It was compensated for by additional cash. And ownership is the key, because communities should have ownership so that they have a real stake in those assets, and they generate some real significant money, not crumbs. And that could be invested by, for example, community development trusts in local housing projects, local youth facilities, environmental projects, and the rest, not substitute funding. And I fear Graham Day's example of uh, uh, mobile libraries. That, to me, is substitute funding. Libraries as a local authority function should be, it shouldn't be for this to step in and, fund, uh, and uh, fill the gap. Sorry, President officer, I am just finishing. So uh, if communities were in control and were in a genuine partnership, I also believe there would be less resistance to wind energy projects. Mr. Finlay's of the belief is if he doesn't draw breath, I wouldn't get in there to tell him to hurry up. <laughs> And I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I join members in thanking Richard Lockhead for bringing forward this debate on, on onshore wind? Um, we've seen significant growth of onshore wind in the last 15 years, and yes, probably some missed opportunities as well. I think some credit is due to the Scottish Government, um, particularly given that they're elected in 2007 on a manifesto which promised a moratorium on onshore wind. Um, despite that, I think we've seen some sensible decisions. We've seen sensible decisions from government and councils, right projects appearing in the right places in Scotland by and large. And I think we can look forward now, hopefully, to extensions of projects as well, repowering of projects, taking down the older turbines from 10, 15 years ago, putting in place more efficient turbines that can produce more power while reducing the footprint of wind farms on the landscape. And there are opportunities, yes, through this new repowering initiative particularly if we look at it from a landscape scale approach to start to embed more community benefits. Some of the early uh, negotiations that many members have talked about uh, where there was no commitment to community benefit or perhaps at a very low level of £1,000 a megawatt, there's an opportunity now to renegotiate these and ensure that communities get a much more significant amount of the benefit. I think it's important though that we recognise that benefits, financial benefits are not compensation they are sharing the financial rewards with the communities that host the wind farms. There may be crumbs off the table, but they're not compensation. And I think the danger is that if we class community financial benefits as compensation, the logical conclusion of that is that that then becomes a material consideration in the planning system. I think that could create a very unhelpful precedent, particularly if you then extend that to fracking. Planning decisions shouldn't be made on the basis of the size of a financial benefit that's being offered. They should be based on the merits of the development. Is it the right development? Is it in the right place? But I think the elephant in the room in this debate is, uh, is land reform, quite clearly, because the best way uh, to share in the rewards of projects with communities is for communities to actually own the land themselves, or at least if they can't get ownership of the land, to be able to take a, a share, a financial stake in a project through a joint venture. That ensures that they don't just get the crumbs off the table, but they get the cake, as Neil Finlay said, and they probably get the bakery as well. If you look at Denmark 1990s, the fantastic growth of wind that we saw there was driven by land-owning farmer cooperatives coming together to develop uh, wind power in their communities, making a huge contribution. Now, we've seen impressive growth in Scotland, but it's come, by and large, from estates working with large corporations. Brazer Dune Wind Farm, for example, in my area, Moria Estates, the big landowner, they probably own most of Richard Lockhead's constituency as well, working with corporations um, to develop a wind farm early on. Since then, ownership of that wind farm has been passed around since 2006. But the original community benefit level of £1,000 a megawatt has remained the same. It's never actually gone up. And although that's made a significant contribution to the community, about £72,000 a year, uh, it's not transformative. It buys, you know, play equipment and kit for the playgroup. What it doesn't allow the playgroup to do is to actually buy the building, which they, they desperately need to. So, uh, you know, we need transformative opportunities. If you look across the Fourth Valley to Earlsburn Wind Farm, they're one of the early joint ventures where the community bought into a project. Um, by the time they've paid off their share in that project, they'll be earning about £400,000 every single year. So a transformative 
opportunity there. But ultimately, as the last point I would make, it is in relation to how we unlock the capacity going forward, because we do at the moment see dozens of megawatts of onshore wind capacity stuck in the system. It can't find uh, a route to market. Uh, and I would say to Alexander Burnett that you know, Westminster government needs to realize that onshore wind farm is the cheapest form of renewables. We, now, we al must allow onshore wind to compete on, on price and contracts for difference, allow them to compete in the market for subsidy free market support. We'll see more appropriate development coming forward, and it's only through that that we can then start to unlock some future community benefit. Communities will need a greater stake in that. They'll need land ownership. They'll need pro part project ownership as well. But if you're just going to collapse the industry uh, and not allow growth, then you're not going to see the kind of opportunities coming forward. Call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Maurice Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And firstly, I'd like to congratulate Richard Lockhead on securing today's debate and giving colleagues the opportunity to discuss an aspect of Scotland's role in renewable energy production, which is rarely at the forefront of discussions on our low-carbon future. Scotland's already a world leader in renewable energy, helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and ensuring we benefit from the creation of green jobs, with Scottish renewables estimating 8,000 people are directly employed in the onshore wind sector. Some benefits of wind farms are less obvious. For example, farmers and other local landowners receive rent for the turbines erected on often fairly unproductive land, repurposing it to provide a sustainable income. Much of that money will then be spent locally, further reinforcing the wind farms' enduring legacy of investment. The benefits of wind farms in Scotland do not end there. Beyond creating sustainable employment and clean energy, wind power also generates opportunities for local regeneration and community empowerment. But more can and should be done with community ownership of turbines actively encouraged whenever and wherever possible so that more people and more communities can benefit from turbines in their area. In Cunningham North, many local initiatives have already benefited from the lease of wind farm community funds such as they are. Since it became operational in June 2006, Dorai Community Wind Farm has generated enough electricity per annum to power approximately 11,800 homes, displacing around 20,300 tonnes of carbon. In addition, it provides annual community benefit funding equivalent to £2,500 per megawatt of its installed capacity, totalling £45,000 per annum. By the time the farm's 25-year operational period has come to an end, the local community will have benefited, benefited from over 1.13 million. But of course, if the £5,000 recommended amount per megawatt was actually um, spent uh, in the local community in terms of our community benefits, that would be £2.26 million. Uh, Kelburn Wind Farm Community Fund uh, in my constituency provides financial support to Largs, Fairley and Cumbria with a focus on projects delivering social sustainability, environmental and energy efficiency. The board publishes annual reports on the value of grants made, the community groups to benefit and the nature of the projects and this information is freely available. Other renewable sectors should also bring community benefits and at SSE Hunterson offshore turbine test site £238,000 has been invested in its community fund since it began in 2013 with grants to 102 projects and fairly alone. These range from £3,000 for the Primary Parent Council to fund our Children's Adventure Trail, £2,340 to support their granite growers and £6,000 for the bowling club to help refurbish their car park. Of course, not all areas of Scotland are suitable for wind farms, national and regional parks and other areas of outstanding national beauty, for example. However, Richard Lockhead's motion raises the important point that community benefit is spread unevenly across Scotland and often communities do not see it in their locality, as indeed Graham Day and others have touched on. In 2014, North Eastern Council report revealed that communities receive only 20% of the £5,000 the Scottish Government recommends developers invest per megawatt, with the maximum benefit paid by any wind turbine development just £1,570 per megawatt. The ad hoc nature of contributions does not optimise resources for community projects. New onshore wind farms will not have access to UK Government subsidies and the Scottish Government cannot oblige payment of community benefits or determine how funds are spent. But while developers are encouraged to follow the good practice principles set out in 2014, some communities and campaigners have called for more transparency and accountability about how funds are spent. An ease over transparency and auditing of actual developer contributions breeds hostility and mistrust of energy companies and may increase reluctance among residents to support future developments. If the local community has questions about significant discrepancies between the reported community spend and the stated benefit per megawatt installed, they should be able to receive clarification and hold developers to account. 
Presiding officer, I look forward to the steering group reviewing good practice and principles report and the outcome of the formal consultation to be undertaken this year. It's right that communities and industry stakeholders shape the process. It's vital that funds for community benefit are distributed fairly and prudently. I support Scottish Renewables' calls for a flexible and holistic approach to community benefit packages, re-emphasising the need for more transparency and accountability in the sector. I call Morris Golden to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Uh, thank you, President Officer. We all understand how onshore wind has been used to deliver environmental benefits, helping replace fossil fuels to the point where it accounted for two-thirds of our renewable electricity generation in the last quarter of 2017. However, coupled with environmental benefits is the potential for huge economic gains, particularly at a local level. We can already see this in viral economic success in action. UK emissions are down by two-thirds since 1990, while the British economy has increased by a third. In Scotland, emissions are down over 40% since 1990, and renewables, uh, onshore wind in particular, have provided significant economic benefits for our communities. For example, the motion notes how communities have already received millions of pounds from onshore wind projects this year alone. In addition, almost half of all British onshore wind jobs are in Scotland. Thousands of high quality jobs that will positively impact communities through increased spending and tax revenues. Scotland wide, we benefited £1.5 billion in revenues from offshore wind in 2015. And it is estimated that over its lifetime, every turbine is worth over half a million pounds to the Scottish economy and over 100,000 pounds to local economies. This is capitalism and environmentalism working hand in hand to protect our environment, create jobs and boost our economy. Certainly, Mark Ruskell. Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the member for giving way? Uh, on that basis, does he believe there should be more onshore wind farms in Scotland, and if so, where? Maurice Golden. I think that there should be uh, onshore wind farms where communities support them, certainly, and there's a, a compelling case to ensure that where local communities are advocating uh, onshore wind, then we should allow them to receive that benefit which onshore wind undoubtedly provides. Um, uh, and overall, as, as good as these numbers are, they are in some ways divorced from the practical day-to-day -day needs of people who are asking where their share of the renewables boom is. And it's a fair question because not every community can easily access the rewards. Some communities, such as high-density urban areas like Paisley, cannot easily accommodate wind farms and must settle for indirect benefits or rely on others to share the proceeds of their own projects. Or communities might find themselves competing against one another or facing requirements to access funds, such as with the East Renfrewshire Renewable Energy Fund, an important and welcome funding source, but one that individual communities do not have full control over. Furthermore, cash payments are not the only social economic benefit. For example, having a say in how projects are run might be of greater importance in particular areas. I recently raised the matter with the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy, and I was encouraged that he recognised the importance because ensuring everyone can benefit is key to maintaining wide support for further carbon reduction. Current support for renewables is overwhelmingly strong, 79% in a recent UK government survey. But we risk squandering that good will if only some reap the rewards whilst others bear the costs. It is for these reasons that we are calling for the introduction of a renewable energy bond, uh, an opportunity to ensure that the rewards of our renewable future are distributed more evenly by pooling and sharing ownership. Just as we want every individual to feel they have a stake in the success of the country, so too do we want communities to have the same aspiration, something to work towards, invest in and empower themselves through. The task for all of us is to make sure that this actually happens. Uh, before I call Mr Macdonald, who is the last contributor in the open debate, 
If we're going to allow the minister to respond at all, we'll have to extend <laughs> slightly. Um, so, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 814.3 to extend this debate by up to 30 minutes. And I would invite Richard Lockhead to move a motion without notice. Thank you. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That is agreed, and I'm pleased that we want to hear from the Minister. <laughs> I call Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, and uh, <coughs> I thank Richard Lockhead for raising this debate on an issue which was topical when I was the responsible Minister consenting wind farms some 15 years ago, and which is still topical today. And as Neil Findlay said, uh, the most direct community benefit now as then comes from community ownership, and Udney in Aberdeenshire provides a very good example. The Community Trust in Udney owns the local wind turbine, it supplies electricity to local homes and businesses, and it uses the proceeds to support local development and good causes. I've seen for myself there the buy-in of local people, from the farmer who owns the site, to the volunteers who get together to decide where best to spend the revenues generated to benefit their local area. I am also familiar with the plans of a community enterprise on a larger scale in the Isle of Lewis, where the Stornoway Trust was one of Scotland's first community landowners as long ago as the 1920s. The Trust is the landlord of crofts and common grazings across the parish of Stornoway and is now working on the Stornoway Wind Farm project, one of several consented major wind projects in Lewis, in this case in partnership with EDF. We have seen the vital role renewable energy can play in community land buyouts, as Mark Ruskell referred to, from the hydro scheme on the River Don in Aberdeen to single wind turbines in islands like Gia and Egg. If communities having a share in ownership brings the most direct benefits, then the interconnector to take power from Lewis to the mainland will be an enabler of community benefits. It must be built uh, with enough capacity to take power from projects which already have consent, like Stornoway, and to stimulate community-led projects across the islands by allowing them to sell their surplus power to the grid as well. Not every community enterprise can have ambitions on the scale of the Stornoway Trust, and that is where local authorities can also be vital enablers. Aberdeen Renewable Energy Group was set up by the City Council and helped attract European Union funding, and now Swedish energy company Vattenfall has built on their work by deploying the world's largest wind turbines in Aberdeen Bay. They are due to be commissioned later this month and I was delighted to be able to visit Scotland's newest wind farm just a few days ago. This is truly a scheme of scale and it comes with community benefits to match. Vattenfall this week announced a £3 million scheme uh, involving investment of £150,000 a year for the next 20 years. 10% of that will be ring-fenced for communities nearest the point where the power comes ashore at Black Dog while the rest will be open to bids from communities right across Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. Projects will have to demonstrate both community benefit and environmental sustainability, but clearly there is great potential there. It seems to me that all of these wind projects in different ways point in the right direction. Farm scale and community owned wind energy generation at small scale bring benefits to the whole of rural Scotland, as in the example of Adney and indeed others mentioned today. Scotland's islands, Orkney and Shetland, as well as the Hebrides, offer a whole new platform for both wind and marine renewables, with community enterprise as one partner, as in the Isle of Lewis. But they need the right connections to succeed, and I hope the Minister will agree with that, and agree that the Western Isles needs a 600 megawatt connection if it is to maximise the economic benefits to communities there from wind. Aberdeen has been the oil capital of Europe for 40 years and is now developing renewable energy on a European scale with millions of pounds in benefits for local communities. We want more projects such as these. They need to have community benefit and support, adequate infrastructure and political backing. And we want a diversity of cooperative and community enterprise and an active role for local councils too. And I hope presiding officer that that is the positive message that we will send from this debate today. I now call Paul Wheelhouse to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister.
Thank you, Presenting Officer. I was worried you were going to say I'm going to have to use the half hour that you extended the debate by, but um, I would like to thank Richard Lockhead, as others have done, for securing this debate and what is a very important issue. And I'm aware that over the years he has taken a keen interest in this issue and is active on this locally in his Murray constituency. Indeed, Mr Lockhead has uh, corresponded with me on the matter uh, a number of times. And as colleagues across the chamber will not be surprised to hear, it's also an issue that I take particularly strong interest in, and we'll say more, more about that shortly. I'm pleased that the motion gained cross-party support. I think that is important. It demonstrates that, broadly, uh, we share a common view that communities across Scotland who live near onshore wind developments, or indeed any renewable energy project, should have the opportunity to share in the rewards from their local energy resource. And, presiding officer, before I respond to members' contributions, I'd just like to set out what this government has done, is doing, and our plans for the future. I think it's important to emphasise that due to reservation of powers that are contained in the Scotland Act 1998, the Scottish Government has no direct powers to oblige developers to pay community benefits or determine how funds uh, are spent. In the absence of clear powers, we have focused on developing a coherent and ambitious energy strategy for Scotland and driving new standards of good practice in community engagement and community benefit. And the latter in particular, the subject today, has been effective in helping to transform industry practice in recent years, bringing transparency and openness into a system that I know some have viewed as being characterised as being secretive and divisive. We may not, may not be entirely there yet, but I, I hope uh, members will acknowledge progress has been made. And it is important to stress that community benefit payments remain a valuable source of income for local communities. And Graham Day made that point in the context of declining leader funding in his area. And they are supporting a wide variety of projects, including health and well-being activities, training and student support and employment opportunities. We've heard other examples uh, given today by members across the chamber. In the last 12 months, we focus on only those projects that are not wholly community-owned, almost £15 million, or around £3,400 per megawatt uh, per, per installed capacity, um, has been given to local communities which have a direct link to a renewable energy project through hosting a commercial development. These projects can make a real difference to communities and in many cases can be transformational and of course these payments typically, typically will continue for each year of the project's lifetime. For example, uh, last year, social housing providers such as Berkshire Housing Association in my home area of the Scottish Borders and more recently Fine Homes in Argyll have developed projects that will invest in new social housing while paying the community benefits to host communities uh, in line with our good practice principles. I understand in the case of Berkshire Housing Association, it's uh, three turbine fishermen, three wind farm uh, at Coburn's Path will generate £20 million in new revenue for Berkshire Housing Association to help fund an additional 500 affordable homes over the 25-year lifetime of the site, while also meeting good practice principles on community benefit as well. And the publication in 2014 of our good practice principles for community benefits from onshore renewable energy development has been critical to our success. The publication of the document has provided a benchmark for the sector and fairly quickly became an invaluable tool, particularly for those communities with little or no experience, a point that's been reflected by Neil Finlay and other members in this discussion. And the Welsh and UK government has also adopted the document for their own use. Uh, Scotland very much leading, is very much leading the way across the UK in how we deliver renewable energy projects, ensuring that communities are front and centre. I welcome that developers and communities on the whole have adopted the good practice principles which have helped uh, to increase trust and credibility. I will indeed. Richard Lockhead. In light of the fact that no wind farms in my constituency pay anywhere near the national standard, but not just that, that there are solar farms now being built in my constituency, ironically by a company called Elgin Energy, who I think are based outside of Scotland, uh, can he confirm that the principles and guidance applies to onshore renewables and not just onshore wind? Therefore, solar farms and other forms of energy should also be paying uh, towards community benefits. Paul Wheelhouse. So that, that's certainly the, the intention. It started, as uh, I think uh, Mr Lockhead knows, in looking at projects that took place on government land, principally the Forestry Commission land, and seeking to ensure that good practice was maintained in terms of payments per megawatt installed capacity. Um, but I, I recognise the, the, the point that Mr Lockhead makes. Unfortunately, community benefit is not part of the material consideration of planning, cons uh, planning applications, but uh, in regard to the recent, uh, recent uh, consent for the, wind, the solar farm he refers to, but I believe um, that the relationship between developers and the local community is clearly critical to ensuring a positive experience and outcome for all parties. 
I do acknowledge there are examples of developers not adopting the good practice principles or that relationships between developers and communities are broken down. It does often happen at the point of sale of a, of a farm and I, I'm aware of a number of examples where that has occurred, not least in the example that Mr Lockett has given today. Uh, and we clearly want to try and look at those issues in the context of uh, the review that has been mentioned already. Um, I'm also aware that uh, we, we clearly have to work hard to ensure that we can explain um, that sites that were developed prior to 2016 uh, did not benefit from the, the policy being in place. So it's really kicked in from 2016 with developers um, now taking that, the good practice on board. And I'm glad to say that most uh, projects that we, we encounter do uh, reflect the good, good practice guidance uh, from then on. But it is disappointing uh, that we continue to recognise the, the vast majority do, uh, do follow the good practice principles, but there are, of course, others that do not. But looking to the future, I want to ensure that the next generation of onshore renew renewables, including onshore wind, continues this positive and valuable relationship with local communities. However, we must also accept there has been a profound change in the support mechanism. Mark Russell referred to this uh, a couple of times. And investment conditions, particularly for onshore wind projects, are more challenging. Changes to UK government policy over the last few years have resulted in greater uncertainty around funding a, a route to market. There has been highly, this has been highly frustrating, to put it mildly. And we continue to argue constructively that UK government should rethink this position and provide a price stabilisation mechanism to provide a route to market for the sector, as Mark Ruskell says, perhaps through contract for difference auction pot, which does not require subsidy, subsidy and, and letting onshore wind compete to provide electricity at uh, low prices. But I want to stress that my expectation remains that developers should continue to offer meaningful community benefits. I think Richard Lockhead summed this up, uh, others such as Lewis MacDonald refer to community owned projects as well. There is a, effectively three key players in these negotiations, the landowner, Sometimes it is the community, uh, also the uh, developer, of course, and the community that surrounds the site. And we need to see a fair result for all three. Uh, now, sometimes the community are the landowner and the immediately affected area, and that sometimes means we maximise the benefits uh, through community ownership. But where there is a developer-led project, we need to see balance, and we need to see a fair allocation of the benefits to all three. But it is, community benefits should continue to be an integral part of all new projects, but we recognise that it might be packaged differently. For example, there may be sh more uh, shared ownership, which has been referred to by members. And last December, I published Scotland's energy strategy, an accompanying detailed onshore wind policy statement, which included a commitment to review our good practice principles during 2018. As I've mentioned in correspondence to Mr Locker, the time is right to undertake such a review. I'm pleased to say it's not my intention to make wholesale changes, but instead to enhance and amend some aspects to better reflect lessons learned and current and future investment conditions. And the process has started. Um, if I have time, I mean, Oh, why not? Thank, Bruce McDonald. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And I thank the minister for taking the intervention. Uh, will he, in that context, uh, agree with me that in, or in order to enable the fulfilling of the potential of the islands of Scotland for uh, both energy production and community benefit, we need adequate interconnection between the islands and the Scottish mainland. Paul Beale has. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wholly endorse that view. Uh, we've put forward, uh, we believe, a strong argument in the consultation on remote island wind, which thankfully was successful uh, in seeing uh, that technology included within the uh, forthcoming contract for different pots. Uh, but we do maintain that it's absolutely essential that uh, all three island authority areas have uh, the required island connections that they need. Uh, and I would endorse uh, Mr Macdonald's view on that. We have established a steering group, though. Uh, this process has started, as uh, members have referred to. Uh, the membership comprises representatives representatives from developers and, importantly, communities who will oversee the process, and I thank them all uh, for their participation. To date, the group has met twice and it has been reviewing feedback from a number of stakeholder workshops that have been held, with further workshops planned for later this month, and a formal consultation on any proposed changes to good practice guidance is planned for later this year or early next year. Uh, and in terms of just points uh, to finish off, um, presiding officer, and just in reference to points raised by members, I would just like to point out, in terms of our planning aspirations, uh, we have a target th that by 2020, at least half of newly consented renewable, renewable energy projects will have an element of shared ownership. We believe shared ownership will play a key part in helping meet our target of one gigawatts of community and locally sourced, uh, locally owned energy by 2020 and two gigawatts by 2030. And I'm pleased to say that as, as at June 2017, uh, and we're due to have updated figures in the near future, of course, uh, progress to that target was 666 megawatts worth. So we were making good progress. Uh, there were points made around uh, renewable energy bonds. We're happy to look at that. We raised that issue in the context of our own energy strategy, but I recognise Mr. Golden's interest in that area. And I think he raised 
raised the point about um, the high degree of public support. Um, even in UK government uh, commission surveys of 79%, um, that's reflected even higher levels in Scotland, as he knows. And I think community benefit has played a large part in creating a more positive feel uh, for uh, onshore wind development in, in our country. But I'd like to uh, just close up, presiding officer, that saying, by saying over the years we've transformed our approach to community benefits. We are making the whole process more transparent by publishing national guidance. We have uh, taken the, the effort to argue that this has been the, to the benefit of the industry as well as local communities. As while it's not a material planning consideration, it has helped build those levels of support. However, time is now right to take stock to ensure our good practice principles remain fit for purpose as we embark on a new chapter for onshore renewable energy. And uh, there have been a number of issues raised today in the Chamber that I'm happy to ask the steering group to look at in the course of their deliberations. But let me conclude by reiterating I'm committed to ensuring that Scotland's communities continue to benefit from local renewable energy projects and to see a fair, uh, a fair share of those benefits derived by communities. And we will work with all interested parties to make that happen. Thank you very much. Uh, three concluding paragraphs later. That concludes the debate. And the meeting is suspended until 2.30.